All right, today we're going to be having a look at this 2019 MacBook Air that randomly stopped turning on. So we already have the board out of the enclosure, um, and when we plug it in on the USB amp meter, we get around 20 volts and pretty much no amperage. So I'm going to plug that in to get the exact measurement for you guys. So I have here, and I'm going to switch over to our desk view so you can actually see. It looks like I have here 20 volts and 0 0.05, and it just stays there. So typically when we see an issue like this on this board, it means one of two things, or one of three things. Um, either behind door number one is the board is in recovery or DFU mode. Um, we already checked for that. Um, that's what we checked for that on intake, and it was not. Um, so it's not option number one. Option number two is there is a short on a subrail somewhere. Um, that is the oftentimes the most fixable fault that will present like this. Or option number three, the T2 is having issues booting Bridge OS either from a dead NAND or a dead T2. Now, unfortunately, a lot of these boards um, that have this issue or have this reading will end up being a NAND or T2 issues. Um, so generally, the first line defense uh, for issues like this is high resolution thermal imaging. Now, emphasis on high resolution because oftentimes your lower resolution thermal imagers will not be sensitive enough to pick up the you know small capacitors that tend to short and cause this issue. So that's going to be our first line of diagnostic. I'm not going to check any voltages first. I am just going to thermal image it and see if we see anything out of the ordinary. So I'm going to grab our thermal imager and we're going to get started on imaging. All right, I have our imager right here. What I'm going to go ahead and do is plug in our board. I'm going to take off my amp meter for now because it's kind of hard uh, when we're flipping the board around. And I am going to enable our thermal view just like that. And we're going to see if we see anything. So what I like to do, especially on an issue like this, is I'll plug it in. I'm going to wait until I see stuff um, getting hot and then um, unplug it and move on. So see we have some heat from our T2 and our PMIC. Now this is not totally in focus so I'm going to focus it the best that I can. There we go. That is normal PMIC boot up. Um, I could go in for a high resolution look too but again I'm not seeing anything abnormal right here. Um, we see some emissivity differences which is normal like that. We could just yeah. Sometimes if you're you're confused if something is an actual fault or just emissivity, you could actually defocus it a little bit, um, but it looks fine. Let's go ahead and have a look at our uh, PMIC. I'm going to unplug it and plug it back in. Let's have a look at this. Um, now, when your board is cold and there's no obvious hot spots, the camera will pick up on the strongest um, signal that it sees, which is often a reflection of its own lens. Um, so imaging a cold board can be a little bit difficult. We see normal PMIC um, functions right there. Our T2 is getting warm while the PMIC is entering its boot up sequence. So our T2 is at least trying to do um, some normal um, normal functions there. But otherwise, this side of the board looks normal. Moving on to this side. So let's just go right around this, the back side of the T2 area type area right around here. Let's see if we see anything. I'm going to plug it in. We're going to wait and see. All right, I have a coil getting warm there. And that's probably normal. That's what coils do. Hot on the other side of the T2. That's normal. I mean, our T2 is a processor, and it is doing its job. I'm going to zoom back out to see if we see anything out of the norm. So we do have that big hot spot. That's all from the T2. But again, that's normal. Um, I have a few little, oh, OK, that's something, maybe something right there. See, so. Notice how there's a shininess right here. I'm moving in, it goes away. Same with the shield here. Okay, that's something to determine. That's how you can. You need to differentiate between actual emissivity problems like this, where it's just the shiny shield reflecting um, infrared radiation from around the room, or if you have an actual hot spot. So see here, I have some hot spots right here that are actually a capacitor. I'll just point to them right here with my finger. Okay. Uh, my fingers actually, my fingertips are really cold. Um, but you see that it looks like a hot spot, but it's not. But right next to it, we have something else that looks hot. So we have a potential area of interest right here. Okay, so it looks like, okay, so I'm going to zoom all the way in. We're going to go pretty close, as close as we can get. All right, so I have a resistor or a capacitor. Something right there is getting hot, and that heat is actually flowing into the trace right next to it. I'm going to unplug it. Look at that. So as soon as we remove voltage, it goes away. I'm going to plug it back in. Give it a minute. Give it a minute. 
Look at that. Interesting. You could actually see the heat just flow like that. All right. What actually is this? I don't know. But let's zoom out and let's see what we have right here. So it looks like we're going to have, come on, go and focus. We have a chip, couple components, and then that looks like a resistor based on how it looks on here. But I'm going to switch over to microscope and we're going to have a look um, because microscope is obviously going to be more accurate than just looking and guessing at what something is via the thermal camera. So I want to say... All right, here's our shiny spot that we had. Let me get this in a focus our scope. So this looks like our shiny area. It's a no stuff capacitor. This was throwing our thermal off right here. All right, and then we have the two capacitors in the chip, and then one of these guys was getting hot. But when we look at this, that's a resistor. Now, resistors don't typically get hot. Uh, resistors aren't something that, that typically gets hot under use. However, they can, okay? And the reason why is you have to remember in a circuit, when you have a short circuit, the thinnest wire gets hot. Sometimes that's a MOSFET. Sometimes it's a coil. Sometimes it's a resistor. Sometimes it's a capacitor when all that voltage is going to ground. All right, but when I see this, I see this side getting hot on this trace. So I'm thinking something on this line is shorted to ground. But now that we have this here, we can actually, we know what, what, what's going on. Let's actually check voltage and see what we have here. Let me first pull this up on the board view. Then we're going to check voltages to see what we should have and go from there and base a diagnosis off of that. Um, sometimes, and this is something you need to be aware of, also, um, oftentimes it is normal for resistors to be hot. Some resistors can normally get hot in use. So you do have to be careful about that. Um, but anyway, here's our component right here. Here's our resistor. We have PP5VG3S, and then we have PP5VG3S underscore VCCIO PVCC. And then that goes to a capacitor and the chip. So what theoretically could be wrong right here, if this, if we do have a short on the side, we either have a bad capacitor or a bad chip. But anyway, let's check voltage. I have PP5VG3S on one side, so I'd expect 5 volts on one side and 5 volts on the other side, as this is just a current limiting resistor most likely. So I'm going to go ahead and check that. I'm going to go back to the microscope and I'm going to check. Now, oftentimes people don't believe me when I check voltage, so I'm going to measure voltage through here and I'm going to show you guys on my handy desk view camera right here. So we have our Fluke 287 ready. I'm going to look through the scope and measure on here and I'll show you guys too. But on one side of this, I have 5.12 volts. On the other side, I have zero volts so the resistor is essentially blocking all voltage through here okay all that voltage is dropping out okay i'm going to show you guys again through the scope how i measured so i have one leg on one uh, lead of the meter on ground right 5.12 nothing nothing at all so my next step here i'm going to unplug power from the board i'm going to put our multimeter in continuity mode so you can hear the beep okay so we're in continuity mode all right, we have a beep, healthy beep. All right, one lead on ground. For continuity mode, it doesn't matter. On one side, on PP5VG3S, I have 100 ohms to ground. That's a bit low. And on the other side, I have 0 0.6 ohms. Okay, we essentially have a short to ground on that side. Now, this resistor here, what, how many ohms does this resistor read? This resistor is reading 300, 400 ohms. Now, what is it supposed to read? So generally when they use fuses like this, they tend to use weird value resistors. In this case, the 2.2 ohm resistor. It's reading 400 ohms to ground, 400 ohms to ground. So this resistor essentially acted like the fuse and blue protecting our PP5VG3S power circuit. If it didn't, then everything else would be pulled down to ground on that line and it wouldn't do anything, most likely. It would be stuck at 5 volts. So we have two options here. We have a capacitor and our chip. Next thing what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a very, very close visual look at both of them. For the chip, I'm going to be looking for any holes, um, any discoloration. And for the capacitor, I'm going to be looking for any cracks or also discoloration. And the first thing I see, I see a crack in that capacitor. So you have the capacitor on the right side that looks perfect and the capacitor on the other side that does not look so perfect. All right, that is a typical blown ceramic capacitor, appearance of a typical blown cracked ceramic capacitor. It shorted, it got very hot, very quick, and it fractured because of that rapid temperature change. That's what ceramic capacitors do when they get very hot, very quick. 
So I am very confident now that this is our issue and I'm going to grab a donor board and we're going to replace that resistor and that capacitor. I do not think we're going to have to do anything with our chip. I think our chip is going to be just fine. I think the capacitor just failed. It does happen from time to time and unfortunately ceramic capacitors are very reliable. More, much more reliable than your typical uh, electrolytic capacitors. But this is something that, the, that can happen to them. So we're going to go ahead and take care of this now. All right, we have our donor board all lined up. I'm going to put a very small amount of flux here um, because this board is not liquid damaged, so there's no real need to ultrasonically clean it. I'm just going to put a little, little drop in of flux there. That's all we need. And we are going to remove both of these components here, the capacitor and the resistor. Get this nice and in focus. So I'm going to go up to around 430, 120, my typical temperature. Just like that, I'm going to go ahead and grab our components off the donor. Just put a little bit more right here and right there. I'm going to do our cap first. Just like that. And then our resistor, again, I'm going to put a little flux actually around our chip. Just in case those joints are a little bit cold now, I don't want to cause any issues, so. We're just going to preemptively take care of any potential issue. Our little resistor here. And that is done. Let's let it cool for a minute and then we're going to clean up our flux and give it a test. But we should be 100% good to go now. All right, the board is cooled for about a minute. Let's go ahead and clean up our flux with a little bit of isopropanol alcohol. Followed by a little bit of acetone to get any residual residue that we may have fully dissolved. It's always best to clean your flux residue. I really, really dislike when I see it left on board some other shops, so I do my best to get the best of a job of cleaning it as I can. And that should be good. Let's go ahead and uh, see if this turns on now. First things first, I'm just going to plug it in um, on our desk view here. And we're going to see if we get proper amperage now or any change in amperage. Um, and then we'll put it in the enclosure and see if it boots normally. So I'm going to plug it in here. And I should get 20 volts. And it should go up to like 0 0.15 to 0 0.30 once it starts to boot. It might spike to zero point uh, around zero point five or zero point five four a little bit. There we go, point thirty, point five. That is now booting current for this board here, um, half an amp or so. That would um, be around what I would expect to um, see on this. Um, so this is fixed. I'm going to go ahead and reapply the thermal paste now because we did heat the board up a little bit. Um, now, as many of you guys know, this board does take a special type of thermal compound. Um, 
and anybody that takes off this heatsink will realize that. So the heatsink on this particular machine does not actually touch the CPU. There's actually a pretty uh, large gap. So Apple uses a special uh, thermal compound. It's this really black, thick, gritty stuff. And we've searched and searched and searched and could not find anything comparable on the market. So we just created our own, um, which you can actually buy. There'll be a link in the description. Uh, we're just going to apply this new paste and give this device another happy few more years in service. So yeah, you can see the coloration of it. It's pretty much, it's just like a dark gray black paste that Apple does not sell. You can't buy it anywhere and regular thermal paste is simply too thin uh, for this gap and will fall out due to the pump out effect um, after some time in use. The heatsink surface is also this really weird material as well. It's like a porous aluminum type deal. It's actually pretty hard to clean. Just like so, then we'll grab our tube of carbon black here. It's essentially the same color as the apple paste. It's always best to use a ton on these because, again, the heatsink does not physically touch the CPU, so you need a big glob there. And it's better to have more than not enough in this application. All right, let's put this back in the enclosure and let's see if we boot into an operating system. All right, so we have our critical components plugged in. Um, I don't need stuff like the audio board or anything else right now because the board isn't assembled and I, there's a screw that we need to put in um, and we'd have to unplug the audio cable to get that screw in so it doesn't really make sense to plug that in. Um, so we're just gonna let it boot. We do have the battery plugged in and the trackpad because the battery is required uh, for this machine to boot. So now we wait, we have our amp draw. It looks like we might have backlight. There we go. That is a chime. We do have audio from one speaker, but not the rest. That's normal. It's an Apple logo. I have trackpad click. Um, we're just going to wait for it to boot into the operating system. I'm going to keep my hand over here just um, to hide the customer's name that will pop up on the screen. And there's also a very good chance this will start up into recovery mode, which in that case with this unit's very slow CPU um, would take quite a while. There we go. That is booted up into the operating system, and this is fixed. So this one's good to go. Thank you for watching, and I hope this video helps you in some way.